We have little, uh, little sayings, little principles, proverbs, mantras at Blue Water. Um, we, try to, uh, we try to do church in a way that makes sense to people who aren't into church. And we try to teach uh, truth in the Bible to, to make, in a way that makes sense to people who aren't really into the Bible yet. Uh, and you know, we try to do musical worship in a way that makes sense to people who are neither into music nor worship uh, yet. Uh, because that has to do with accessibility, and that connects back to like lessons that Jesus gave us 2,000 years ago about being willing to leave 99 sheep to chase down the one who has gone stray. In any church service, the most important people are the people who are showing up for the first time. In any church service, any, any church generally, the most important, the most urgent people are the ones who are just seeking after God for the first time, you know, trying to get the ball rolling with God, maybe checking uh, out questions and stuff like that. Uh, and one way we can materialize that, we can make it real, is that when you come to church, sit up front, fill in the front and the middle first, because when the seekers come, when the newbies come, they're not going to sit front and center, are they? because they're a little shy. They're checking things out. And where do people stand when they're checking things out? On three. Where do people stand when they're checking things out? Yeah, on the back, on the side, because they're checking things out. Uh, this was so important that uh, when God gave instructions to the ancient uh, Israelites to build the temple, he actually created this thing called the seeker's court or the Gentiles court that was slightly outside the area where the observant Jews worship because God always wants to make space for the seekers. That is a long-winded way of saying if you're a regular blue water attender and you come, make space for the newbies and make space for the seekers. Don't require them to sit front and center because that's kind of rude. How many of you have heard me say something like that over the last 11 years? How many times have I said it over the last 11 years? 11 times? That's 1,100 times. And so, come on, don't make me say it again. Uh, we'll leave the 99 to prioritize the one, uh, and the, the people who are most urgent in the heart of the Lord are the people that we need to make the most comfortable, we need to make space for. Everybody say amen. That was scoldings, kind of. It was kind of scoldings, but it was also kind of encouraging and accessible, right? Right? I'm on fire today. Yeah. There you go. Um, we are doing this uh, sermon series on the everyday Bible, and the idea is to make the Bible accessible to people who aren't really into the Bible, because the Bible kind of an important book. Have you heard of it? Here it is. This is, this is the one that I use mostly uh, these days, and I can just carry it around with me in my pocket, uh, which is really cool, but has really hurt Zondervan and other Bible publishers, unfortunately. Um, it's a really important book in world history, really important book in the history of the church, filled with stories and wisdom that have bubbled up to us through history and help us live every day, hence the everyday Bible. And we have learned a method for approaching the Bible, like when you read a passage in the Bible, when you read a story in the Bible, the first thing you do is kind of ask yourself, well, what generally is this about? You know, kind of orient yourself to it so that you know what you're getting into. And then the second question you ask is... What bugs me about this passage? Because when you figure out what bugs you, what bothers you, uh, then you're on your way to learning something. You're on your way to wrestling with the scripture and asking yourself a question. And then the final question you ask yourself with respect to a passage in scripture is what? How do I apply it in my life? Because you want everything to be practical. You don't want to just leave it out there in the air. You want to take practical steps, uh, like sitting front and center and filling in from the front as a way to make practical Jesus' parable on leaving the 99 to prioritize the one, uh, for example. All right, so uh, today um, we want to wrap up our series on the everyday Bible by doing it in real time. So here's, this, here's the experiment. Here's the exercise today. I have not really prepped a sermon. What you're going to do is you guys are going to give me issues, or questions, or mysteries that you have in life today, today, because it's the everyday Bible. 
And the way you're going to do that is, I think we have a slide. Uh, we're going to send people out into the crowd with microphones. And if you're really brave, uh, you're going to just tell me what your question is. You're, it's going to take you like 30 seconds. That's the rule. No longer. Or you can email questions to info at bluewatermission.org and Quok, the handsome Quokwit, will, um, will uh, receive those emails in real time and pass them to me. So that if you're, if you're bold, then you can just speak into the mic. If you're uh, less bold or you're, you need to think with your thumbs, uh, you can email it to Quok. And then we'll answer those questions in real time. Uh, a passage will pop into my head, and we will go through it together. You understand? Everybody say amen if you understand. Everybody in the back, nod your head if you understand. <clears throat> What's a sample question, for example? Uh, be before we get there, uh, I'm being helped by my lovely wife. The point of the exercise uh, is just to kind of is to demonstrate what it is to walk every day with the Bible. Because you go through life and something pops up. Uh, I've been walking with the Bible for over 50 years now. And inside my head, I have an index of all of this scripture, all of these stories, all of these Jesus teachings. I've just been stuffing them in my head uh, for a long, long time. And whenever I confront a situation in life, I can, without too much effort, think of a Bible passage that has some bearing on it. Are you following me? So it has become a practical index in my life. How many of you have, have so much scripture in your head that you feel like you can do that? All right, good. Four of you. So what a mature church we are. I've been teaching the Bible here for over 11 years, and, uh, and four of you have learned. If my teaching sucks so badly that you have no scripture stories in your head, you have no passages in your head, then the world has made it very easy for you. For instance, you can go to a place called BibleGateway.com. This is not a joke. BibleGateway.com. And it's got a little search bar on the top. And you can type something in. Like, for example, Sonia, you can type in something like, money problems. And it will suggest passages to you. It will suggest them both uh, by word search, like it will give you passages that contain the word money, or, or topically. Uh, and you can actually select. You guys have all used Google before, so you know how to do this. Um, never been easier. So if you're not reflecting on the Bible practically every day, um, then you just haven't developed the habit yet. It has nothing to do with your knowledge. It has nothing to do with your abilities. It's simply a practice. It's simply an exercise. So how many of you think the Bible is a pretty valuable book? Okay, slightly more than four. We are making progress, people. But even if, you're, even if you don't, Right? Even if you've never interacted with Scripture, even if you're new to church, even if you're still making up your mind about God, uh, the Bible has been around a long time. At the very least, humanity has found it extraordinarily useful through the millennia. And you might want to check it out. And once you get into it, uh, you know, all sorts of doors open. And it might actually help you with seeking after truth, or seeking after meaning, or seeking after God. All right? End of sermonette. Can we do this? So uh, I'm going to give you like 20 uninterrupted seconds to just think about, well, you know, here's something I'm carrying today. I wonder what Scripture or the Lord might say about that through Scripture. Just think about that. And then we'll share the exercise together in real time. It's an insanely practical Sunday. And we really like that, don't we? We really like that around Blue Water. All right, so 20 seconds, go. This is for me. I don't know whose this is, but I'm drinking it. Mmm, rum, Eunice.
musicians. Oh, and if you are listening on the live stream, you can email info at bluewatermission.org and Quack will receive that. So you can participate over the live stream if you want. You guys notice the birds nesting over here? So in my mental biblical index, I think Psalm 84, even the sparrow has find a place to nest near your altar, O Lord. Yeah, so just sparrows. And for that, I'm about to get pooped on, I think. All right, we got some? All right, now, uh, who wants to participate? And uh, we have all sorts of cultures and subcultures in here. You know, some are sort of louder and brash, like maybe the, mm, I don't know, mainland Howley. I'm just saying, I'm just saying, you know, willing to kind of put their, their, themselves forward. And some are a little shy and retiring, like maybe, I don't know, the Samadai local kind person. Everybody gets to be equally uncomfortable at Blue Water. So even if you don't automatically think that you should participate, come on, bless your brothers and sisters and jump in. It'll be okay. So Quok and Sonia, and is Lila participating in this? Lila's way in the back. Uh, they have microphones you can speak into or just start firing off emails to Quok right now. So let's go. Raise your hand. Yeah, you have to identify yourself somewhere. The lovely Claudette Springer. Our, our first participant is Tahitian. This is Claudette. Hello. What is your favorite scripture and why? What is my favorite scripture and why? That's, that kind of violates the spirit of the exercise, but I'll tell you anyway, because I like you, Claudette. It's supposed to be your burden. Uh, that was my question. I, I don't think it does violate my, I don't know. That's how I interpret it. I really want to know, you, my pastor, what your favorite scripture is right now. No judgment. My favorite scripture right now, I mean, like, I got all these scriptures in my head. Uh, my life verse is Matthew 11:12. From the time of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven has been advancing by force, and it takes a forceful person to get a grip on it. It's my life verse. Um, Jesus said that. Uh, my favorite piece of scripture right now is the story of Jacob wrestling with the angel. Uh, I don't know if you know the story. I won't go through it, but... He had been through some struggles. He was about to meet his brother. He thought his brother was going to kill him. He was scheming to kind of make it go well. And during the night, God sent an angel to literally wrestle with him physically. And it was after that that his name was changed to Israel. And Israel literally means wrestles with God or fights with God, struggles with God. And I'm definitely someone who fights with God a lot. Uh, and the life principle here is that you're going to struggle in life. Just make sure that your main struggle is with the Lord. And then even if you're a cantankerous so-and-so like me, you end up holding on to what's important until he blesses you. Just a minute. From Genesis. All right. Good. That's how it works. Got it? And then you can look up Wrestles with Angel on Bible. Gateway.com, if you want. All right, Pastor Jordan, and I got a question. I got a bunch of questions flying in online, so thank you guys. We'll go as much as we can. So here is the very first one that actually came in. This is from Courtney, and she says, How can I be salt and light in this situation? A dear friend has invited me to our birthday party where there will be psychic reading and a type of yoga. Okay, I want to celebrate with her. I want, I'm praying about participating in the yoga, but the psychic reading, which I will not participate in, makes me wonder if I should even be there. Brilliant. Everybody hear that? That's an awesome question, Courtney. Way to rock. Um, so I love the way uh, the question is framed. How can I be salt and light for my friend? Right? Did you catch that? That was the framing of the question. And that is a quotation of scripture from uh, the Sermon on the Mount from Jesus, that our job is to be salt and light in the world, to make a difference in any environment in which we are find ourselves, and that is always the priority. Jesus says, uh, if salt loses its saltiness, it's good for nothing. In other words, the point of life is to have a point to your life. 
and, uh, and make a difference and, and, and draw people to God is the point. And so Courtney is thinking about, well, how do I draw people to God in this situation? Brilliant. That is the precise, correct way to go about thinking through the situation. Um, and uh, the problem is that there are psychic readers there, that there are supernatural things going on there that might not be healthy. Because just because you're supernaturally gifted and can sense things supernaturally or mystically doesn't necessarily mean that you're tuned in to God. You might be giving demons an opportunity to speak with you and stuff like that. So that's the problem. Uh, I love situations uh, like that because if some psychic wants to read me, that means I get to read the psychic, right? And so if they want to prophesy to me, this does not bother me and it does not contaminate me, it does not touch me, right? Because uh, he who is in me is more powerful than he who is in the world. That would be the scripture, right? That's a popular one. Everybody knows that one. Uh, so I would probably feel quite free to go to that party. I would go confidently and with faith, and that would be my rule. It's like, well, here's a psychic reading. Oh, that's interesting. You're psychic reading. You know, while you were talking, I felt like I had a reading. Only mine, uh, I feel like, comes from the Lord God through the power of the Holy Spirit. And here's what I think the Lord would say to you. I think uh, the Lord has given you these gifts in your life. I think that the Lord has this calling on your life. Uh, I feel like the Lord would want to point to this type of situation in your life and say to you, be careful. Uh, the ways of the Lord are holy, or something like that. You getting the feel for it? Uh, and we practice that kind of reading only we call it prophecy or hearing from God. We do that in every Blue Water small group, every Blue Water Ohana group, precisely for reasons like this. It's because we serve a God who speaks in real time, and we get to share that God with the world. In 1 Corinthians 14, Paul describes how a good church service should work. And he says, when a non-believer comes to your church service, the prophet should prophesy to that person, and the person will fall down on his knees and exclaim, God is really among you, because the secrets of his heart will have been laid bare. Like, you come to church not to hear a pastor who speaks, but a God who speaks, and our main job is to teach you to hear for yourselves. Right? Brilliant question. I love it. Gold star for Courtney, brownie points in heaven. That was a great question. No, no, no pressure for the rest of you, but I love that. It's uh, another one. I'll, I'll keep going with the next one on, uh, on through email, but if for those of you guys who are in person, please, yeah, just raise your hand or stand up. Okay, so um, one question, and it, there's two actually that came in from two different people that are somewhat related, okay, Pastor Jordan? So the question, where well, first question is this. This is from Brenda, and it says, how can the church respond to systemic racism and racial injustices. Uh, and the related question I feel like is from Albert and says, what does the Bible say about critical race theory? I'll skip the critical race theory one because to do that I would have to explain what critical race theory is. And that might be, uh, maybe we can talk about that some other time, but it's all the rage in academia and you're hearing about that a lot in the news these days. Basically it's about, uh, cultures and systems that are inherently and inescapably racist and it says that you must approach the world as if given cultures or given systems are inherently racist and you have to tear them down if you want justice. Uh, the first question, which I believe was from Brenda, which is how, how do you respond to systemic racism? Um, uh, and the word justice was there in, in the question, uh, which like, I mean, that's one of our key words. Like we just talked about justice ministry, a blue water justice is a, is a powerful wor word, a very important one, because it's important in the Bible. There are something like 1,500 separate uh, verses about justice for the poor or the disadvantaged in Scripture. It's everywhere. Uh, and Jesus says always to prioritize uh, the poor. Isaiah 58 would be my favorite passage in this regard. Uh, spend yourselves on the behalf of the hungry uh, loose the yoke of oppression. 
uh, the Lord commands his people in Isaiah 58. He says it's far more important than religious observant or rituals. You know, again, make a difference to those who need a difference. It should always be the priority. And then he goes on to say in Isaiah chapter 58 that if we do it uh, sacrificially, that our light will rise like the noonday sun, will be brilliant and shining to the world in such a way that we make a difference to the world. And of course, that is a great calling, and we should all be dedicated uh, to it. Um, the, here's the thing about systemic racism that I find really challenging. Uh, Jesus says, on the one hand, prioritize the poor. On the other hand, he says, judge not lest you be judged. Uh, and um, the systemic racist dialogue in culture these days makes it really hard to love the disadvantaged without pointing the finger at the supposed oppressors. And our job is not to point the finger at the supposed oppressors, and certainly not to point the finger at, at folks who are only systemically involved, you know, sort of participating in a secondary or tertiary uh, sort of way. So I think what we want to do is love the disadvantaged sacrificially, which means like super priority, super active, you know, uh, I've tried to do this a lot in my life. We've tried to build a church on that basis. I used to live in super dangerous, uh, ethnically specific neighborhoods where technically I didn't belong. Right? And this has been a big part of my life, so I'm really dead serious about this. We have to prioritize the caring bit, but not to come across as judgmental. Right? And Jesus modeled that in his life by walking in the midst of an incredibly oppressive, murderously oppressive situation, his people were occupied by the Romans who were literally murdering them daily and would eventually murder him, actually. But he almost entirely refused to address the oppression, but instead talked about the love and the justice and the sacrifice half of it. Right, you following me? So that's, that's very, I mean, that's complex, but I think that's our call. Uh, in this situation. You can point out injustice, but try not to point the finger uh, and come across as judgmental. And if you pull that off, you'll be doing good kingdom work. Good kingdom work in a world who needs good, that needs good kingdom work. So I, I use four or five different scriptures there, but hopefully you get the idea. Great, how about one live? Who's got a live question? Come on, raise your hand, stand up, flag something down. Is that John? Way in the back. Lila's got gotcha. you. Okay. All right. This is going to sound kind of ignorant, but how do we know that all the events in the Bible actually happened? Is it like faith-based or is there like actual evidence? I mean, wait, that sounds very ignorant, but how do we know that everything in the Bible actually happened? Uh, great question. And I, I, love, I love the preface to it. This may sound ignorant, but uh, there are two types of confidence. There's a confidence that comes from knowing how to do something, and then there's a confidence that comes from, there's a confidence that's shown by figuring out how to do something, right? And so the first step to that second sort of confidence is admitting ignorance or lack or something like that. And so John, being the stud that he is, is like, well, I'm ignorant, but here's a question. Uh, you know, and just remember, John, there are no stupid questions. There are just stupid people. Um, how do we know that, that the stories in the Bible actually happened? Um, that's a super broad question. Um, so I'll give you two types of answers, John. One, uh, the Bible is the most archaeologically proven ancient document in world history by a factor of a thousand. Like, it is amazing, uh, the archaeological and historical support uh, that we have for the book that we call the scriptures, the book that we call the Bible. And this goes back to, like, from Eden all the way through uh, the lives of the apostles in the book of Acts. Almost everything can be independently supported from outside of scripture. Proven? Sometimes. But supported all the time. Oh, it's just a phenomenal book that way. It is, it is unique in world history that way. 
I am utterly confident in the soundness of the stories, even if some of them have been, uh, the details of which have been lost over the centuries. You know, people talk about whether Eden was literal or figurative. They're like, well, it doesn't matter. There's something went down there that was really, really important, and you can interpret it how you want, but we actually even have archaeological support for, for the location that they mention. Anyway, and all that stuff can be found online if you care to look at it. I find it fascinating. We can talk sometime, you and me. I can point you in interesting directions. Here's the second way that I think uh, the Bible testifies to its own veracity. And we'll just focus on the Gospels for a second. Uh, what I love about the Gospel stories, the Gospels are the four books in the Bible that tell the stories of Jesus' life. They're like journalistic accounts of what, what happened when Jesus was walking the earth and doing his thing. And uh, they don't read like any other uh, uh, account uh, from that period because they don't try to make Jesus uh, a perfect hero and they certainly don't try to make the 12 disciples perfect heroes. They are filled with embarrassing details. Embarrassing details. One I was thinking about recently, if you read through the Gospels, the women folk always come off better than the men folk. Right? Am I right? Yeah. Every time. Every time. Now, why is that significant? Because, like, we pretty much all know that women are godlier than men. I mean, we pretty much all know that, right? But why is it significant that 2,000 years ago the Bible was saying that? Uh, it's because it was, a, it was a more strongly patriarchal culture. And for the Bible to say that Jesus was supported in his ministry from the financial strength of women, women were supporting the men in the early Jesus movement, that would have been a humiliating detail to share in those days. But they shared it anyway. Which means nobody was pretending and nobody was trying to cover everything up. And there are like probably 20 different examples that I could give you. Uh, that's just one that I've been thinking about recently. So it reads like true journalism, true history. It even shares the foibles of the so-called heroes. We get to see Peter and Paul arguing with each other about what correct theology is. Like They're not trying to hide anything. So whatever else you say about scripture, the people who participated in and wrote the New Testament actually believed it was true. Now you have to make up your own mind of whether you think it's true but they were giving you as accurate an account as possible. And, uh, and then beyond that goes all sorts of independent historical uh, accounts as well from guys like Josephus or some of the early church fathers. Good answer, John? It's a good question, bud. All right, how are we doing? A couple more. Yeah, Lila's got you. I cannot see who that is, but ask your question. Oh, okay. oh, oh, sorry, sorry, I'm so used to it. Um, what do you make of people who were super into Jesus and then they walk away and renounce their faith? Do you think that's, how does that happen? And what can we do about it? Yeah, the question, if you didn't hear, what, what do I make of people who are super into Jesus and then time goes by and they end up walking away uh, from their faith. Uh, what do I make of it and what can we do about it was uh, the tagline there, which is an important tagline. Um, here's a weird way to answer the question. If faith is easy for you, you're doing it wrong. Uh, and this goes to my life verse that, you know, from the time of John the Baptist till now, the kingdom of heaven has been advancing by force. Tem some translations will say violently. And it takes a forceful person or a violent person or one who suffereth violence is the way the King James puts it to hold on to uh, the kingdom. If you're living life like Jesus lived it, if you're being sacrificial, if you're prioritizing the one over against the 99, um, if, you know, if you're being obedient, if you're living, as Jesus says, in the world but not of the world, there's a lot of turbulence that comes with that. And um, I have, I'm, I'm not surprised when people who are really into Jesus uh, drift away, 
because uh, you can be really into Jesus during a comfortable time and then drift away from just pure fatigue, <laughs> you know, just because you feel like an alien in the world. Uh, or, as James says, uh, because you've given the devil a foothold, just a little tiny space in your life. Well, you're like, Christians are like elite athletes. Like, for a normal person, eating a candy bar every day isn't going to ruin you. But for a professional, I don't know, track athlete or something like that, the effects will be super destructive, right? There's just not a, a, a ton of margin for error. You can't even give the devil a little foothold, a little finger hold. It's, it's a tough business. Um, at the end of his life, Paul says to Timothy in 2 Timothy, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. He was celebrating that he made it to the end because in this life it's hard to finish well if you do it correctly. It's hard to finish well. If you run a marathon correctly, you collapse at the line, right? You're like, you're really, really tired. You can walk it and be less tired, um, but that's not the race. Um, so the first thing uh, I do to people who have fallen away is like, I give them a big hug, literally or just sort of you know, metaphorically, and say, I get it, I get it. Even Jacob had to wrestle with God. You know, it's, it can be a real struggle. I'm not surprised, and neither is the Lord. Um, however, um, let's, get back, let's get back on it, you know, uh, because uh, the Lord restores. As Paul said in the Galatians, you were running a good race. Who, could, who cut in on you? You know, what, what did you let take you out? Um, the best thing to do, the best thing in my life to help me with that is fellow travelers, is people who get it, who are living the same sort of life I'm living. I don't even need to talk to them. I just need to have them around. And they validate my struggle, and they validate my ups and downs, and they inspire me to keep going. So... Uh, lots of people uh, have valleys with God. It's normal. It's normal. So is recovery. So is recovery and growth. Um, so, again, I threw four or five different scriptures at you. But last question. And then, yes, uh, Sonia, the young lady standing next to you, what's your name, honey? Hi, Dad. <laughs> oh. Um, you do realize we live together, and you could ask me a question. Yeah, like, but I thought other people could hear the answer, so... Um, it's my girl. How do you teach an unbeliever to question rather than just trying to force answers on them? How do you teach an unbeliever to question rather than just force answers on them? That, that's like... That's a brilliant question. <laughs> What, what a girl. Good parents. Good parents, that girl. It's like, it's an exceptional child. She must have a, an exceptional family. Um, so that's one of those questions that gives the answer uh, in itself, right? It's like, how do you teach an unbeliever to question rather than just trying to force answers on the unbeliever? Because that's the key, right? Jesus said... Uh, to his disciples after telling them the parable of the sower in Mark chapter 4, um, that the secret to the kingdom is seeking. The secret to the kingdom is to go to Jesus and ask questions. Uh, we have an old saying at Blue Water, we haven't used it very often, that conversion doesn't mean having the answers to all your questions. Conversion means going to Jesus with your questions. Uh, that's what conversion means. But seeking is the secret to the kingdom, uh, learning to ask questions. Um, so you can't force answers on anyone. If you want to convert someone, if you want to give someone belief, you have to teach them how to ask questions. And the best way I know how to do that is to ask questions of them. You know, and we have the five discipleship questions at Blue Otter that we used to teach. You guys remember them? I won't call on you to recite them. But number one is, what's God been saying to you recently? Or what do you think is important in life? Same sort of question. Uh, what are you doing about it? What's hard about that? Um, who are you trying to influence for the good and how can I help you? Uh, and if you ask those questions of anyone, you will get them seeking, you will get them questioning in, in their own mind. And I learned that, 
I formulated the five discipleship questions by observing Jesus, who only twice in the entirety of the Gospels answers a question he gets asked. In all other instances, he answers a question with another question. Uh, and then he usually like did a miracle or demonstrated the answer and, instead of like trying to force it on someone. So learn to be a really great question ask asker. That's the key to evangelism. Be a great question asker. That is the secret uh, to influencing people who are not inclined to believe. And uh, God will give you great questions. Hey. Are you going to ask one, Aaron, or are you just rocking the kid? All right, can we leave it there? Actually, I, Pastor Jordan, I actually have one really good one, that, which I think it helps us to wrap up the whole sermon, sermon series. And it's a very, very personal one um, and authentic, which I appreciate, is um, that we all can relate to. So this is from Francesca and says, how do you find an answer for an issue or decision when your emotions are too high strung or caught up in it to hear God's voice? How do you hear God clearly when you're really emotional and stirred up? Yeah. Uh, that happens to people in different ways. Sometimes it's stress. With me, it's usually anger. You know, I get so angry that, that I, can't, I can't trust myself to hear God correctly. Um, <clears throat> well, I, I, th I think about that memory verse. Uh, in, in all things with uh, thanksgiving and prayer supplication, make your request known to God. Um, there's a lot in that verse. Um, <clears throat> but essentially it says, uh, try to get your mind straight and then ask God for help. <laughs> That's my paraphrase uh, of the verse. So it's kind of like, how do you get your mind straight? And uh, there are several verses like this in the scripture. Um, a lot of the Psalms uh, I think of Psalm 43. Um, uh, why, uh, the different translations of it, but why so downcast, O my soul? Why, so, why turn down within me? Um, uh, Psalm 27, you will see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Um, there's a lot of self-talk uh, in Scripture, uh, but all of the, all of the uh, attitude adjustments tend to circle around thankfulness. Um, so if you can practice thankfulness, all of these verses sort of suggest, you know, be thankful for three or four things and then listen to God. That's my best practical advice. Um, I've, you heard me talk about the 100 thankfuls before. Have you heard this technique? It's an old Jordan story, but uh, I was suffering through a period in life in which, uh, let's just say, someone I loved had been treated very unjustly, and I was so enraged that I could barely make progress. Uh, and so what I did is that um, every morning for I don't know how long it was, like two months or something, I would start my day by speaking out roughly 100 things that I was thankful for. And if you know me, like I'm, I'm a complainer and I'm really grumbly. And so those things do not necessarily come out of my mouth well. And they're like, oh, thankful that the sun came up today. Oh, you know, I'm just thankful that uh, although the traffic sucks, I have a car to drive. You know, so it was sort of like compromised thankfulness. But by the time you get to number 100, you're really having to reach deeply to find stuff that you're thankful for, and, and it tends to be a little more legitimate. And then at the end of that, I could actually pray for the situation. Uh, before that, I could not pray for the situation. Uh, so I did my own attitude adjustment, and scripture tends to say that the best attitude adjustments are sparked through exercises of thankfulness. You know, so I, I, I'm terrible at them, I'm really bad at them, which means I value them. <laughs> because I know how necessary uh, they are. Uh, and then you generally hear God pretty well, or you can, of course, go to Ohana group and put yourself in the middle of the prayer circle and ask other people to hear God for you. But even then, you want to be in a good frame of mind uh, when you go there. Uh, I often can't hear from God very well, but all of you can. 
and so I rely on you in times of great stress to tell me what the Lord is saying. Yes? All right, we are over time. That was a very strange way to do a sermon. Did you like it? Um, again, the whole idea was just to provide a snapshot of everyday Bible, everyday interaction with scriptures, and that this is a really practical book, and the idea is to kind of get scripture in your head. What is it about? What bugs me about that? How do I use it? How do I apply it in my life? And you do that, and you become a Bible surfer in the best possible way. The wave of Scripture pushes you forward, and it's exhilarating, and it's powerful. And for 2,000 years, the followers of Jesus have been finding it extremely profitable, and I hope you do as well. Uh, Father God, I thank you that you have not left us alone, that you have left us the Holy Spirit to walk with us and to remind us of things that Jesus taught us, as it says in the Gospel of John. I pray that you would remind us of what is already in our head and help us to use it well. And I pray, Lord, that you will accompany us and provide our needs, whether they be financial or physical or relational or emotional. I pray uh, that, as it says in Exodus, that we would be your people and you would be our God, that we would own each other in intimacy. In Jesus' name, everybody says...